you just want to like run through a brick wall after that. I mean, you could run through a brick wall. But hi, hi uh, nice to see you there. We are all wearing our Peckfest t-shirts today, as you were told. And that's for a reason, it's because this Wednesday we're going to throw, you can come, you can get some anger out, some uh, built up, uh, I don't know, you know, test or it may be stressing you out. Well, you can throw a dodgeball at someone, right? And I think we allow headshots, so. And uh, we have separate guy and girls leagues, but it's fun. And uh, easy opportunity for you to bring a friend to, get a team from school. Remember, every group that has at least one a visitor is going to receive a special, uh, I'll call it a coupon, that you're going to be able to uh, redeem during play. And I'll just say, leave it at that. But this may increase your chances to win the championship. So even just bringing one visitor from school and saying, hey, come throw dodgeballs and trampolines. And they'll be like, okay. And so that's great. And yeah, don't let money be an issue. If money's an issue, come talk to us. Now, we offer a lot of different varieties to get in. The cheapest way you can get in is $10, and you can jump for three hours, eat pizza, watch uh, things, and you can still participate in our slam dunk competition. So everyone should be coming to this if you want. And so, and you can come late, if you got practice, come on, it's gonna be great. And we're, we're real excited about it. Let's talk about, you know, we're in Genesis. I was, uh, when I was in, when I was in college, we, uh, me and my friend, planted a, a tiny little garden in our backyard. Didn't really do so well. Have any of you tried to, like, cultivate and, like, grow um, your own garden ever? Or any, like, more green thumbs out there? Maybe not. I mean, I'm not, like, it wasn't that great. We were just trying something new, right? And so we called it the Shire. It was real small. And uh, we have a few, few pictures of that. This is all building up to talk about a really giant garden that's across the street from us right now. Uh, you know, whenever you see growth, it just gets you, uh, man, look, we put mulch in there and everything. Uh, we go to the next picture, and, uh, oh, actually, I'd put that in there because that was, I think that was like the first year, or one of the first years Instagram was out, and so if you can't see it, but like everyone put borders in their photos back then. How old are you, Keats? <laughs> all right, so uh, you go to the next photo, and uh, yeah, so we have some growth. It all died shortly after this, so we don't know what happened. I think a neighbor cat got in there and um, buried some mice or something. So anyway, uh, uh, building all this up to say we have such an incredible opportunity happening right across the street. It's called what? The Shiloh Field, right? If you look at the next, yeah, Shiloh Field. And this is actually a Genesis reference. I don't want to give it away, but you'll find that out in a couple weeks if we're in that text. And so uh, it's really cool. Of course, you know, Gene Gumphrey is there. A lot of you have volunteered. If you were in Salt a while back, we went over there once. Remember when we didn't take all the gloves? And we were, uh, we were uh, helping weed out uh, weeds uh, from the blackberry bushes, which had really sharp thorns. And we didn't have gloves, and it was cold, but we still had a good time. I had a good time. Yeah. See, the junior hires aren't even here that went. They had a horrible... No. We went and left. You can go every Saturday morning and help out. And uh, even in the summer, you can go and pick blackberries if you, go, you know, if you go in the right times. They offer it up sometimes. Everything gets donated. And years back it was, I still think it is, uh, whenever you label something like the largest, other people around the world try to beat it. They're like, now they know how, you know, uh, what they need to do. But at least in 2017, 18, it was the largest in the United States community garden. Not garden, but just uh, in general, but community garden. I hope it still is today. It doesn't matter. It's still massive. And everything uh, goes back to first feeding the homeless and the people in need. And the rest is can, gets donated, all the food grown to several ministries. I mean, in the first few years, let me have some, I have some facts here. In the, just the first five years, we grew over 100,000 um, 100, pounds of produce to be donated. And uh, this is no small task. Yeah, if you go to the next one, you can get your own plot there. So if you have a green thumb and you don't have a big backyard, you can go grow things there and help maintain it, cultivate it cultivate the garden. It takes a lot of time. If you, if you, uh, if any of you come from like a farming background, a lot of patience, a lot of trust, a lot of time, a lot of care. Even in growing, a lot of you have, uh, maybe you show uh, rodeo goats. I mean, I know the stock shows in town. Maybe you show uh, goats or uh, maybe you own horses or something. If you own animals, that takes a lot of your time and patience and a lot of your attention. I don't know. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know. Invite me to your events if you, uh, I don't know what you do, but I'd like, yes, I'll, I'll come support you. Shiloh Field. Maintaining that takes a lot of volunteers. You'll always see Gene asking for more and more volunteers. They always need more uh, because it's a lot of uh, land uh, to look after and uh, 
because of the fall, we'll learn last week, you know, you'll have all these weeds and things that can come and try and destroy your produce. And, and so this is an amazing opportunity. Guys, and it's happening right across the street. I think it's real cool that we don't want to just be an inward, um, the church is for saints. You come in here and we huddle and we worship and we learn and we go back out. But it's also supposed to be an outward um, reaching effect. So this is light to the world. This is really, really, really cool. And I'm proud of this. And maybe we can do something where we go one of these Saturdays all together and, I don't know, we'll break and go to Chick-fil-A or something. But we're going to see, I did all this because I really just want to set up this morning, which is, could be, it's going to be just an incredible morning in the second chapter of the book of Genesis. And it's a story, like I said last week, that we've heard maybe a lot. It's the creation of humans. And we're going to find ourselves in a garden for a lot of this morning. And I, want, I wanted to talk first about, for reference something that's right across the street, and so later when we, we read something in the text, I'm going to refer back to this. Shiloh Field takes a lot of patience and care, it takes a lot of work, the word work, to work this garden takes a lot. Even uh, they had a huge gr group of students out there yesterday, it meant so much to Gene, he can't do it alone. And there's so much to do when tending to this. We started this really cool journey, as you saw in that video, th through the book of Genesis. When I first thought about this last fall, I'm like, okay, we've got 2020 coming up. Me and my high school friends, when we ever heard that year a long time ago, we're like, wow, we'll have flying cars back then and jetpacks. And that hasn't happened yet. But we're still not close. <laughs> anyway, so I was thinking, that's such like a futuristic year. And so what do we need when we're thinking like 2020? How do we have good vision? There's the joke. Well, we need to go back to the beginning. And so let's, uh, let's call it Genesis 2020. And Genesis is like, you know, beginning. So it's kind of like an oxymoron. Beginning 2020. So there you go. Ha ha ha. Genesis 2020. This is why we're in this journey through the month of May. And we have $5 journals that have scripture on one side and then paper you can journal on the other side for $5. And they are in our resource center in the commons. Please make, oh yeah, make yourself, uh, make those available to you. There you go. We want you to have a strong foundation. We looked at the world's tallest tower last week and we said, look at that foundation of the building. And the reason this this building's able to soar above the clouds is because of the foundation set beneath it. They can reach, it can reach any height it wants, and that's our prayer for you, for y'all. That's our prayer for you, that you would be able to soar above the clouds, to go out from here, and when the first gust of wind comes along, your faith won't be shattered. It won't come tumbling down, because it's just not, your faith isn't my faith, it's yours. You can defend it. You're walking with the Lord yourself. And we need a proper foundation. And that's what Genesis will give you. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of the story. It holds a lot of the keys to understanding the rest of your Bible. A lot of them. A lot of things are started here that will get finished. They're still not finished and things that will be seen more through Jesus. Genesis 2020. And the, the picture, you go to the next slide. We have the... The planks on the left and the patriarchs. It's kind of a fun way to look at the book, and that's how a lot of people teach it. If you go through Young Guns or the women's program later, this is how they teach it. So you've got creation, humans, evil, redemption, civilization, judgment, nations, and just chapters 1 through 11. It's dense. It's packed. And then we have patriarchs on the right. We're going to look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and a lot of their wives and kids, and it's a lot of fun. It's going to be amazing. We are just in humans this morning. In chapter 2, last week we saw creation, and we, we got to see some really cool animals. We got to think what it was like about God just tossing these planets into, into space. And today, in chapter 2, we're going to zoom in on creation. Chapter 1 was more of a chronological view, the seven days. And we're going to zoom in today. Moses, the author, who was inspired to write the book of Genesis, is going to say, you know how important it is? that he made man and woman as image. Well, I'm going to write a whole chapter about it. I know I just said it in a couple of verses, but this is not like a, um, this isn't just so separate. This is just like a zoom in. He's like, let me zoom in on this first before we move on to chapter three, because you got to know how important you are. You got to know how important you are. And in verse four of chapter two, it kind of stands alone and it sets us up today. In verse four, 
It's kind of, you see in your Bible, it may look a little separate. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. The creation of man and woman. This is the history of mankind, of humans. And Moses is going to lay it out for us. Literally everything else in the Bible, everything else forever. He's saying this is the beginning. This is all the other creatures are great. Yeah, that cattle, livestock, great. But this is different. This is human beings made in the image of God. This is special. There's a special word there for generations, toledot, and it, it just means history, generations. And, and you're going to see this all throughout the book of Genesis, the generations of people. How you start the book of, Math, uh, of Matthew in the Gospels, you see it like a generations log. You see how is Jesus connected all the way back there. You see this log of people connecting them. History of human beings starts here. And in chapter... 2 verse 5 and through 7 we're first going to see God make man and I just challenge you this morning maybe hear this with new ears listen on and if you heard the story even if you just read it lean in and look on and say God pray hey God would you show me something today maybe I haven't seen yet in the text would you change me would you would you make me a little different more like you through chapter 2 because you can do that the Holy Spirit can do that and I'm going to get real excited and just, this is such a great story. And I know what's coming up, and I know some of you do too. This is, this is great. Um, girls, hang on. We've we, we got to make Adam first. You're going to get uh, a lot of special attention coming up. Sure, you can yell for that. That's great. You can yell whenever you want. I don't, you can yell whenever you want. But just don't distract everyone else around you. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God, oh, that's interesting, it's just said God so far. When the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the earth. Now, we can't do this justice. These two verses, three verses, I'm smart. These three verses actually confuse a lot of people. And theologians write books and books about this. Do you know why? Because it, was, it shows you a different aspect of creation before there were humans. And it's fascinating, and it's sort of confusing. And so there's a lot of different theories of what this means. I don't want to get into it. Some people think that uh, this is not in the Bible. This, this is a theory. Some people think of like, okay, God may have made like this canopy, and it protected the earth, and it just kind of missed all the time, and it didn't have to rain. Like, yeah, all this stuff. And then it got broken up by the flood. You can think of a lot of different things. All we know is that somehow the, the plants were receiving water from the ground, this mist, and there was no man yet to help uh, maintain the garden. And so you could say, okay, this is life on earth, but um, this was land before there was like farming and someone's attention on earth. It's, it's really interesting. It's just, and it gives it just a couple verses, but it's so much more. This mist coming from the ground, it allows all these plants to grow. Remember what all God had made, and now six days. We're still on day six here, zooming in. He had filled the earth. He unfolded that for us. God made all these things, all the plants and all the animals. Verse 7, then the Lord had an idea. We heard this last week, when he, but watch this. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. I was talking about that word God earlier. It says the Lord God. So the word God, Elohim, was also used in chapter 1. And that's just God, God of the Bible. Got it. But now it says Lord God. In chapter 2, it's going to say Lord God all the time. And it's like, why, did, why Lord God? It means God is with his people. And he's more personal and relational. Whenever you see that Lord God, just think, okay, he's, he's with his people. It's, it's closer. He's got this relationship. Can we take care of the front row here? Can we get some guys out of here if we're going to talk the whole time? Thank you. And it said he formed and shaped and molded them, him out of dirt. He formed man from the dust. So think artist. Think time. Think fun. Think creativity. It's been compared, uh, it's been compared to you know, God like molding out of clay like, like Adam. You've heard maybe that before. Job 10, 8 through 9 says, your hands fashioned me. 
and now you have destroyed me altogether. In context, Job had a, a pretty hard life. Remember that you have made me from clay and you have returned me to the dust. He's just referring to it, God, you formed me. You made me. And dust means man, man came from this lowly origin. God used the earth to make man. And that's going to come into play later with Eve because she's different. But he used the earth itself, this dust, to make man. So man has this kind of lowly origin. So man is similar to God, but we are different from God. We are not God. We remain the image of God, but we are different. We have a maker. We have a maker. I think it's fun. Loving care he spent. The word creature God has made, made in the image of him. And he breathed. This is where we, if you have the, you're maybe thinking if you've gone in our Trinidad uh, drama, you, we, we do this scene where God breathes life. And if you've ever played God or Adam, Alexis spends a lot of time teaching you how to wake up. And so God breathes. And sometimes God like actually has to like blow air on Adam in, to make the crowd wake up. And hopefully you brush your teeth. But anyway, those of you that have seen the drama know what I'm talking about. But this is literally, um, we're going to get to who God is, but God gave Adam life. And God doesn't have like a mouth or fingers um, because God is spirit, John 4. But in some way, God just gave life to Adam. The breath of life. Man is, this is so important, man is not like a descendant from God. Think about all the different religions back then of like, where did mankind come from? Well, we, we descended from a God. No, no, no. Moses is right and clear. We are not a descendant by God. We were made by God. We were created by God. A, a scholar puts it, man was a combination of dust and deity. I really like that. Into one. A living creature. Psalm 139, 14. I will give thanks to you, for I am, you know this, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it well. The word Adam, actually where we get his name, it's like a play on words. So the word for Adam and the Hebrew word for earth are very similar. And so it's kind of like a fun like, word play. Well, Adam is from the earth. So Adam, there you go. And it also means one that is red. And so because they're thinking clay. And so uh, it's formed out of the earth. That's Adam. So now we have a name. We have a man. God made this living creature. And now as I was reading this, some of you even just need to stop here and Look, circle that breath of life and it says became a living creature and you can actually transport this truth into your life right now because whenever we accept Jesus as Paul writes so many times we have that spiritual death and we we get woken up by God and he gives us the breath of life and some of you this morning are suffocating and you just maybe need to hear this truth about and remember how God He's the one that gives blessing and life. And he breathed life into Adam. And some of you need that same breath of life this morning because you're suffocating. So we first see God makes man. And in a couple verses, in verses 5 through 7, God makes man. And he's going to do a couple other things. If you want to go to that next slide, it kind of shows it. God is now going to prepare this man a paradise. God prepares paradise. Watch this. And the Lord God planted a garden in the east. Now, I, I made the little shire in, in a college station. This is not like that at all. At all. And it's in the east. And so Eden is not just the garden. Eden is uh, a lot of land. But he's, he's very specific. He said he planted a garden in Eden. And it was in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. So he's like, here you go, Adam. And out of the ground, here, watch, watch God make this. He prepares a paradise. Watch God make this. And out of the ground the Lord God made spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. God made a special home for Adam. He grows up this entire garden around him in this garden in Eden. A paradise. Man now rests in this perfect paradise. We've heard this before. It gets more interesting, though. It's just for him. And the trees look beautiful to look at. Oh, those are beautiful. But they're also, what does it say? They're very delicious to eat. They're very delicious to eat. And don't think, I know we talked about little, even the, the Shiloh field over there, 
whenever we read this, we can't think tiny garden. You have to think orchard. And I put some pictures up there. You need to think massive orchards. Orchards and orchards of trees. This is not from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> They're still not quite sure where it was. But anyway, you, there's some pictures here. Think massive. Whenever we think, it zooms in on two trees. It zooms in on two trees. But there was so, 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 so many trees and things he could eat. Don't think tiny backyard garden or even Shiloh field. Like, think massive. God is doing this for Adam, for man. Huge orchards. And the tree of life, it zooms in on two. The tree of life, we don't know a ton about this. But we do know that maybe God was using it to somehow sustain Adam and Eve. They lived a lot longer back then. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which has to do with man deciding what's maybe best for himself, has to do with wisdom. And we're going to get to that in a second. God does all of this. And then the verses 10 through 14, he talks about these rivers, these four rivers that God sends out. And there's a map there. If you go back to the map, God puts these four rivers into motion. Some of these may look familiar to you, some of the others. I know the last two, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, but they've actually found where a lot of these could be in the body of water. And this is sort of where they think the Garden of Eden was, in the east. God created this paradise, and Adam's there. And what are you going to do next? Well, we, if we're in a garden, we've got a, a human there, let's put him to work, all right? The Lord God, in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to eat and to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded him saying, okay, here's your instructions. Only a couple verses. Here you go, Adam. You ready? Okay, I made you. He commanded him saying, you've heard this before. You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. And boy, howdy, did I make a lot of them. And they're delicious. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. God makes man. God prepares paradise. God imparts instructions. And it's very simple. Adam, it's very simple. It says he put him in the garden. If you want to highlight and circle something, you could say, God the Lord God put him, put Adam in the garden. This is signifying, uh, this is safety. Adam is safe there. God has placed him there. And it has to do with God's presence. He's safe there and, and God is with him. Safety and rest. Those are two words for chapter 2 to, to circle there. Safety and rest. Fellowship. He's cared for. Paradise. Guys, girls, everyone, there's only like, four chapters in the entire Bible that don't have sin in them. This is one of them. Every detail you read is important. Everything else, every other page starting next week, or two weeks from now, we're going to learn about the fall. Every other page is tainted with sin. And you can't appreciate the fall until you realize how far you fell from. It really makes the fall a lot bigger. And we fell hard. We had it good. Well, Adam, to just drink, just to sit there and think about what this must have been like. Adam's one sense job description is to work it and keep it. But more so worship and obey God. You're doing all the things at once. And guys and, and girls, I know we see this word work and we're confused. Because work to us doesn't seem like paradise. At least for me. But work, as we see it in the garden, remember chapter 2, no sin. Work is a gift from God. Work is a good gift from God. I know you're like, no, how it keeps, no, I just, I know when I think of work, I think of, okay, uh, paper due, the, the closing shift, my younger siblings, chores. I feel tired even thinking about work. I feel tired. It's July. You don't get paid much, but your parents have you mow outside. This is all this work. And some of you may love that. But when you think of work, it has this negative connotations. You know why that is? Because work, good work is from the Lord. Work is from the Lord. But hard work is because of the fall and evil. 
work became hard, we toil, we sweat, it's difficult, we get tired because of the fall next week. But as we know in chapter 2, without sin, this is great. I get to maintain this, these orchards? Perfect. Great instructions here. But only one rule. We know it well. Only one rule. You can't, all right, everything else. But, hey, don't eat from that tree. Got it? All right, sweet. That's it. That's it. I love how he begins by saying, look at all that you can do. Now, just not this. Everything else, but not this. Have a blast. It's yours. Just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is showing a lot. This is very confusing to some people. This idea of him saying, making a rule here and saying you can't eat from that. It's saying, hey, God knows what's best for you. Will you trust him, Adam? Will you trust him that he knows what's best for you? Will you believe that? Will you submit? And he gave Adam freedom of choice. He could have just plopped that tree out of there, but it wouldn't have been this free choice. It's like if your mom makes these delicious chocolate chip cookies, mm -hmm, and uh, she bakes them, and you smell them, and oh, they're for, but she says, hey, they're for the bake sale next week. Don't eat one of them. You can't eat any of them. I don't even want to see you eating a crumb. Oh, when you hear that, you really want them. But then, and if, and we can go along with the verse. If you eat it, you'll probably shall die. Yeah, you'll probably surely die. And so what if, it would have been a free choice if she left them out and put like a little, she puts them out and walks away. And they're available to you. You can freely walk by and say, nope, get behind me, Satan. You can walk by and obey. You can truly obey. Or you can truly fail. <clears throat> Where's the milk? <laughs> you invite all your friends over, they're all gone and you're in trouble. Now, your mom could also do this. She could tell you the same thing, but she could put this big glass like jar over it and like lock it. You would still be able to walk by and walk by and you didn't eat them. But you really didn't have the, a choice. You, you didn't have an ability to go eat it. So God has to allow this to happen. It's the eating it covenant. We're going to hear this word covenants. We're going to pass out charts. Uh, not today. I know you don't like the word chart. But let's make a fun word for chart. Diagrams. Uh, you're going to get the chart. A diagram. And this is a conditional covenant. Meaning it, it's, it's on Adam to obey. Adam needs to obey. This is conditional. God set one rule in the place. Will Adam do it? Well, come back in two weeks. We got the bake sale next week. Romania. There you go. Given to prove. Is he... He's willingly under God's command. Let's get Eve into the picture here. Verse 18. I, put it, I wrote it like this. We've seen God uh, make man, prepare paradise, impart instructions. But now, God gifts man with Adam. And that's intentional with how I phrased it. It's a gift. She's a gift. Then the Lord God said, Lord God personal. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now watch this. This sounds like we're backtracking here in verse 19, but just it, it's building. This is like a drama. Moses, good job. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whenever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and all the birds of heaven, all the beasts of the field. He did all that. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. This does not mean God, or this does not mean Adam named every single animal. This is saying, hey, God would bring him an animal and say, uh, what do you call this? And Adam would get to be creative and like, and you know, they had fellowship, they're talking. Who knows if he called it a zebra? I don't know. But in doing so, he's saying all these verses to build up to verse 20, the last verse. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Adam saw so much. Bird in the sky. Elephant. Parrot. I don't know. But in, in his search, he's like, God, there's no one for me. I'm kind of alone here. 
I'm alone. Adam's creation is not complete. He lacked a helper, and God pronounced him, like in the doctor's office, not good. Verse 21, this is not good. This is not good. This is not good. We saw in chapter 1, God's in community. God is trinity. God is, wasn't lonely. That's, he did not uh, create because he was as lonely. He was in perfect community. So we were made in the image. So God wants man to have that same community. There it is. There it is. God knows what's best. God creates a need. The story can't be over. The creations of humans is not over. Enter Eve, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs. That's Adam's ribs. Glad he was asleep. And closed up the place with flesh. Good call. And verse 22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And then he brought her to the man. Lots of questions you have. We got to be careful here with our time. We got a few minutes left. First off, he causes, listen, listen, these are good details. He causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep. This is not so, it's just like, surprise, like we show in the drama. That's also probably really fun. But it's to show Adam, listen, Adam, you have nothing to do with this. I create. I create. And I will bless you with the ultimate blessing. And he took a rib. And now, th this always throws some people off. I know you, you, yeah, you've always had that question. Took a rib. He didn't take, well, this is, he didn't take uh, anything from the head so that Eve wouldn't be over Adam. He didn't take anything from Adam's foot so that Adam wouldn't trample all over Eve. He took it from a rib. Equal partner. Equal partner. And I love how it's just like the rib, Eve, under the arm to be protected near the heart to be loved and cherished. I hear wedding bells. If she was made, you know, if God just made, this is why, so he, he creates Adam. Here's some, all right, here's some clay. <laughs> this will be a man, great. From Eve is different. He did not create Eve from dirt. Why do you think that would have, how do you think if he brought, if he did the same, what's a little temptation there from Adam? Maybe just to treat her with disrespect immediately. To mistreat her. But God's saying, no, 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 no. No, no. She's an equal heir of grace. I made her. She's a blessing. She's a gift. She's a fellow heir of the grace of God. And now what we have here is a helper for Adam. A very, 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 very powerful word, Azer. Adam has this impossible task in front of him to cultivate orchards. To look after it, to tend to it. He can't do that. God literally said, Adam, wow, he can't do this alone. I need someone to help. I need a partner for him to help him complete his task. Man can't create his task without woman. Now, Azer, uh, Azer helper, does not mean servant. Jesus Christ actually used this word to describe the Holy Spirit. So girls, you're in very good company. In fact, scattered throughout the Psalms, this word azer will appear very, not, not a lot. And it describes only, it only describes women and God in the Bible. So there you go. And you maybe see, well, why was Eve made second? It doesn't show that she's inadequate. It shows that she, she is essential for Adam. That without Adam, he could not complete what he needed to do. Enter woman. And even if, if that's not enough, if you're thinking, well, I, I just don't know, Keith, we're in 2020 and all this. Well, Jesus Christ, as we know him, we truly believe in a, few, a couple chapters, the first appearance of Christ will be to a young pregnant girl in the middle of the desert. Incredible. We're the apple of his eye. And Adam got one verse and Eve got six. Let's move on. Uh, so God fashioned Eve. He fashioned her, then brought her to meet Adam. This is not like The Bachelor, okay? This was literally, quite literally, meant to be, all right? Uh, God introduced them, and there you go. Watch his reaction, 23, we're almost done. Then the man said, wow, 
This is la- th- at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the word woman in Hebrew sounds like man. There you go, Adam. Creative, okay. Adam named, so Adam was named because of his relation to the dirt. That's us, guys. <laughs> Eve was named for her relation to Adam. And Adam, as you see here, look, he was extremely grateful and thankful for this gracious gift of Eve. This is God's goodness displayed, brought them together in an equal partnership to maintain these orchards. This is paradise, because it is. And then lastly, hang with me for like three more minutes. God instills innocence. I like alliteration. we got to finish with it. Innocence. This word innocence is tied to the last two verses. I needed, I didn't want to lump these two verses in with the creation of Eve. They have to be separate because God instills this idea of innocence. Therefore, a man, this is Moses kind of, he stops the story. And Moses actually is like talking to like people reading the story now. It's more of a, this is why man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God instituted marriage in the garden. And he said, be united. Be one. The reason man leaves parents and holds fast to his wife is because of unity in marriage. It's literally because of the rib. They're attached. They're equal. She was even named from her relation to him. A good marriage will stand side by side, just like they're attached to each other. They'll stand through it all. God created marriage just as he rose up the mountains out of nothing. From absolutely nothing, so that they might serve the same purpose to reflect the beauty of their creator. And to be a light to the world. Marriage is from God. We see this here. With foundations of trust, commitment, friendship, communication, vulnerability. They had transparency with each other. That's what that means. They were both naked and were not ashamed. There was transparency with each other. Yes, physically, yes. But more than that, like psychologically, like emotionally, they were open with each other. It says naked and not ashamed. This is innocence. God institutes this idea of innocence. This is a time of innocence. No shame, no secrets, no hiding. No worries, no problems. There ain't no problems. And then as we saw in the story chronologically in chapter 128, he says, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. Go tend to the garden. That's the story of mankind, how we were created, humans, as we know it. If you went to the conference yesterday, one of the first talks was talking a lot about this idea, well, uh, you can feel empty fast if you go with science on a lot of the, the older theories. Which would say, you know, you're just, a, you're just another, you, you are not special, you're just another branch on the tree of evolution. That's how you unfolded. This is countering that. This is saying you are unique and you are special. You have worth, you're made in the image of God. God unfolded everything for us. Girls, the world wants to declare you beautiful based just on what you wear. Or what you post and less about who you are. But you need to remember this morning whose you are. You need to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you have worth. Jeremiah 1.5, God was thinking about you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I concentrated you. I appointed you prophet and nations. And Ephesians 1, before he even thought of the universe, he thought of you. Before, like we said last week, let there be light, there was let there be you. God loves you. And he has you exactly where you you are for a reason. Fellas, remember, for us, we need to remember how, how God saw, how God and Adam see and treat Eve. With care. And love. With the utmost care and respect. They, they cherish her. And she's not from the ground. She's from Adam. To be protected and loved and cared for and, and served. To serve her. So Adam and Eve were created by God, for God, 
They have to rule over all creation. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> it's, it's paradise. The order is set. There's more, uh, more value than a, a zebra. Um, Adam and Eve are different. They're not God. They're made in the image of God. We got it. And after all this, God said, very good. Humans are in Eden, which means delight. Everything's going great. Is that an orange? Well, now it is. <laughs> they, they open up the first smoothie shop. I don't know. Uh, God will rest. Man worships perfection. We have peace in the garden. The humans are the apple of God's eye. The center of his affection. Rest and worship. Write that on top of chapter 2. We, we have rest and worship. By the way, this is what heaven's going to be like. A lot of people think we're going to get jobs. And it, remember, it's not bad work. It's good work. I call being a barista. Then we get to rest and fellowship and worship for eternity. We're going back to the garden. But next week, two weeks from now, something happens. And it impacts the rest of this book. And everything. One, there's, there's like two pages. We get two pages in and then something bad happens. So let's have some grace. Let's be humble with our approach in two weeks. We just saw the origin of man and woman. Next week we're going to see the or origin of sin and evil and then redemption. If you've got a tired, if you've got a tired and running soul this morning, just like they had rest, they had rest and fellowship with God, the same is offered for you today. And let me pray for you. Father, thank you for all these students in the room. I pray that if there is someone out there that their soul is tired because they're running. They're exhausted. They're trying to find significance in all the right, all the wrong things. And they're, how they're viewed online, and the friend group they have, and what they wear, how they talk, what they accomplish. And one after another, it just knocks them out and they get more tired and they, and they feel more empty going to bed every night than they ever did before. And they try to fill. They're like, how does this be? I'm like, I I'm trying to fill my life with all these things. How can my cup be empty? This doesn't make any sense. I'm extremely depressed in this moment. I, I pray that they know they were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. At the peak of creation was us, and he has a plan for us. And the idea is that we could just rest and fellowship in the garden with God. We can have peace in the garden. But God, we're, we'll see in a couple weeks, that's, that's changed. And our sin has driven us um, apart from God. And so I ask that if there's, if there's a running soul in here, the tired and weary soul, that as Jesus would say, they could, we, could, we could come to Jesus and find rest. We could just sit down and find rest and peace. That's the idea of peace and rest. It's shalom. It's that your soul uh, can hang up at the shoes. They can sit down. The soul finds rest in Jesus. It's over. We found him. We don't have to search anymore. I pray that a student will find that this morning. You can just rest for all eternity. Like that. Just believe in faith. And we'll ask this in your son's name, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.